Um, hi, I'm John Galfont, and um, I'm going to talk to you about a paper, uh, The Principles for the Ethical Analysis of Clinical and Translational Research. Um, I'm on with our co-authors, uh, Clay Klugman and Brad Pollack uh, from the UT Health Science Center in San Antonio, uh, Texas, and uh, Liz Heitman uh, from Vanderbilt University in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. So I'm trying to <laughs> change my, oh, there you go. Okay. So here's what we wanted to accomplish with, with our paper. First, we wanted to make the case that research ethics extends beyond the treatment of research subjects. Ultimately, translational research affects not just research subjects, but the public at large. Also, we wanted to promote the idea that statistical ethics training should be incorporated in research ethics curricula. Next, we wanted to argue for the ethical imperative of statistical standards in clinical and translational research. And an important part of this is that good statistical practice goes beyond the avoidance of intentional misrepresentation and, at a minimum, requires competence and good standards. Uh, lastly, we wanted to present a terse outline of some of the basic elements and principles that form the foundation of good statistical practice. And we wanted these principles to be very clear and accessible to a broad audience. So why is there an ethical imperative to conduct good statistical analyses in clinical and translational research? This is because novel treatments need to be tested according to the principles of evidence-based medicine. And here, statistics plays an important role simply because of the fact that most novel ideas do not become effective treatments. And statistical analyses block these ineffective or harmful interventions and pr protect the public. So here are six reasons why it's important. First, incorrect statistics could directly harm the st study participants. Second, poor, statistical, uh, poor biostatistics squander human and monetary resources. Third, poor statistics diminish the scientific value of the resultant discoveries and they add unnecessary noise into the scientific discourse. Fourth, poor statistics promote public distrust in research. And fifth, poor analyses could harm the public at large, potentially putting millions at an unnecessary risk. And lastly, poor statistics harm the public reputation of the statistical profession. What we do affects the reputation of our colleagues and likewise Likewise, anyone who practices statistics may unwittingly harm the reputation of all statisticians. So here's the outline of the principles that we would like to discuss. Um, from left to right is the research timeline. From the early conceptual phase on the left to the experimental and data collection phase to the publication phase on the far right. Throughout the process, we need good statistical practice and this requires an awareness of professional ethical guidelines on the top, multidisciplinary expertise, openness and transparency, objectivity, and it's underlined by accuracy in data and computation. And in the early phases, we require appropriate study design, and after the data collected, we need parsimonious model selection, verification of assumptions, quantification of evidence, and avoidance of, mis of misinterpretation. So element one, acceptance of professional ethical guideline. This image depicts a 1,700-year-old Egyptian hieroglyphic oath written in Greek. And this Hippocratic oath is a, a great example of the fact that for over thousands of years, professionals have realized the value of ethical guidelines. We statisticians have our own code of ethics in the ASA guidelines, but these are not always formally taught and are not readily recognized by laypersons. Nevertheless, these codes should be adhered to by everyone that practices statistics from novices to experts. And to a degree, our principles in the paper are aspirational and idealistic, and they're not a list of rules and regulations. But nevertheless, we feel that they have value because it's one way that we can promote the public welfare, broader understanding, and the public trust. So element number two is the need for multidisciplinary expertise both scientific and statistical. And uh, we require expertise cautiously because to non-statisticians, the requirement of expertise can sound protectionistic and self-serving. Further, 
the research team members other than the statisticians can feel that their authority over the data is unduly taken over by the statistician who claims expertise over it. But it's a two-way street in that we need subject matter and scientific expertise as well. That is, in translational science, the data do not come from a primeval void. We do not only analyze the data, we analyze the information. That is, we consider the broader scientific context from which the data arose and the context of the inferences we, we make from it. And if we don't understand the context, we risk making um, serious mistakes. So what, how much knowledge and skill are required? What does it take to be competent? A lot of these questions haven't been answered adequately. Does one need to be an expert or, the, or a specialist in a statistical procedure in order to ethically apply it? In what, which cases does one need to, to be in a recognized authority or in a, in a specific area, or should only certified statisticians be allowed to conduct certain analyses? Now, I wouldn't require that one should identify him or herself as a statistician to do an analysis, but they do need computational skills and a firm understanding of methodology. But I'm left with the question is when should non-statisticians perform analyses? And I, I think it, it depends on the degree of difficulty and the risk of getting the inc incorrect result. For example, a phase three clinical trials carries a lot more risk than an early preclinical pre study, even if the actual analysis is relatively simple. In that case where the risks are high and even though the difficulty is low, we still might require a, an expert statistician to perform the analysis. So element three is objectivity. That is, the analysis should not be done to unduly favor one set of hypotheses. Of course, statistics is not inherently objective because all statistical analyses contain subjective decisions and these should be stated. As we argue in the paper, the data analysis plan should res respect and challenge the, challenge the differences of opinion within the scientific community and the analyst, whether it be a statistician or not, should be an ad advocate for the data and the scientific process, not for a particular result. We should be open about our conflicts of interest and we can list these, but we don't otherwise know how to operationalize or measure objectivity and analysis directly, and that's a challenge for the future. So element four is openness and transparency. All relevant data and analyses must be presented. So the documentation of an analysis is how we accomplish openness and transparency. And documentation is the key manner of holding individuals accountable. Documentation, however, is currently inconsistent. Whereas we would be likely to record incident instances when we feel that others are in the wrong, um, we might not record everything. But this is a biased record. We need to record the analytical process in an unbiased way by including the good, the bad, and the ugly. How should we accomplish this, though, when each data analysis project produces this enormous number of results? One way of solving this is using data, data provenance systems as a means for organizing the numerous computational analyses, but these are in the early stages of development. But do we need the equivalent of the electronic health record for our data sets recording every little result, or do we need, only need to ensure that the published results are reproducible? And open, openness and transparency is also ethically challenged because we have to ensure that the privacy for the study participant is respected, as well as confidentiality for the researchers. We need to respect their intellectual property and their academic freedom by not, by not recording everything they say and including that in a, in a record. Element five, verification of assumptions. So what is an assumption? What is a statistical assumption? To non-statistician, the very word assumption can be perilous and confusing. Because if you look it up in a dictionary, an assumption is a thing that is accepted as true or certain to happen without proof. But when we statisticians say assumptions, we mean that the statistical procedure has, a con has conditions for validity. And we recognize these conditions, such as normality, independence, etc should be verified. However, testing assumptions is also more difficult than implementing methods. So 
when we define competence in statistical practice, the ability to test assumptions raises the standard considerably. Element six is the accuracy of the primary data and computation. Accuracy is the cornerstone of validity. That is, without accuracy, statistical inferences can become meaningless. Of course, we should never tolerate the fabrication of data, but more common, errors and neglect can be equally harmful. Substandard practices promote errors such as the use of Excel and point-and-click software. And a study, of, uh, study in 2004 found that about 12% of the p-values in the journals Nature and the British Medical Journal are incongruent with the, stick, with the test statistics, so 12% of the p-values may be incorrect. And reproducibility in statistics is a very important, relatively new concept, and it means that the analytical results can be reproduced from, from the data by an openly disclosed computational process. And this re concept of reproducibility is a great way to improve accuracy as well as openness and transparency. So element seven is appropriate experimental design and sample size. So there is more to study design than sample size. Poorly designed experiments have little positive value and are seldom recoverable by statistical analyses. But the consideration of power is critically important when we want to assess how ethical a study is. The underlying idea is that for any given human cost, there is an obligation to maximize the efficiency in the experimental design. For example, if two experiments have equal cost with similar scientific value and importance, the one with higher power is preferable because it minimizes risk and maximizes benefits. However, the determination and definition of statistical efficiency are sometimes controversial. So element eight, uh, parsimonious model selection weighed against precision, bias, and validity. So parsimony and fit with the data, that is model fit with the data, oppose uh, one another the same way that bias and variance do. We improve one at the expense of the other, and good statistical balance strikes a, a balance, uh, sorry, good statistical practice strikes a balance between them. And we want to avoid complexity that is only in, inspired by novelty. Complexity in our methods must serve a purpose and be justified both statistically and scientifically. For example, complex models may have less bias and more precision in the presence of confounders when simple models would be invalid. However, there are cases when a complex model is required, but the sample size is too small to support them. In these cases, it can be difficult to draw the line as to where the, where the border of futility lies. So element nine is the interpretation of qu interpretable quantification of evidence. And, um, Quantifying evidence is one of the chief aims of statistics, um, and uncertainty can be expressed in terms of p-values, confidence intervals, or posterior probabilities, which I guess is a topic for a future journal club. But this may be difficult in the setting of multiple hypothesis testing, uh, such as occurs when, when we're doing a genomic study, when there are thousands of tests. And it's also difficult in the context of subgroup analyses when p-values of interactions are very misleading and they can have dire consequences. And element 10 is the avoidance of misinterpretation. Although in statistics we tolerate degrees of ambiguity in multiple perspectives, we also understand that some interpretations are completely invalid or frankly wrong. And claims not supported by the evidence are harmful to the public health. And an important thing to remember about interpretation is that the interpretation of statistical results occurs after the analysis done, is done as a non-quantitative exercise by not only the statisticians, but often primarily by authors, editor, editors, journalists, clinical practitioners, and others, and the public at large. So good communication in terms of interpretation is key 